Whether you've just discovered Warhammer 40k or played a previous version, we're going to help you quickly get a hang of the 10th edition of arguably the most popular tabletop miniature game in the world. You're watching Midwinter Minis, my name's Guy, and in this video we're going to teach you the basics of playing 40k. Rather than just show you all of the random rules and explain their effect, we're going to play a little demo game and show you how the game actually works, and explain things as and when the rules become relevant. Also, if you just want to check out a specific rule or game mechanic, there'll be a list of chapters in the video description. In this demo game, I'll be commanding a small army of Chaos Space Marines. Incredibly powerful, genetically enhanced warriors who have fallen to the lure of the warp. They're strong, tough, and decent combatants both up close and at range. Facing off against me will be my good friend Ant. Hi everyone. For this game, I'm going to be using my favourite army, the Tyranids. Think of the Xenomorphs from Aliens, but absolutely jacked up on steroids. They're fast, ultra vicious, and have loads of awesome monsters to choose from. The Chaos Space Marines and the Tyranids are just two of the armies you'll find in Warhammer 40k. There's dozens of others, from super high-tech aliens to regular human infantry, giant war machines the size of buildings to nuns with guns, powered armoured space monks to whatever the heck this is, 40k's got it all. If you're brand new to the hobby and are wondering what to choose, I would recommend going for what we call the rule of cool. If you think it's awesome, chances are you'll probably have loads of fun building and painting them, and you'll be inspired to play some games. A big misconception about Warhammer is that you need to have a huge army with hundreds of models to play your first game, and you might get to that stage soon enough, but it's much better to start out with just one or two boxes of models. This will help you get your head around the rules and stats bit by bit, without biting off more than you can chew right at the start. As you get more experience, you can start adding things at a pace that you feel comfortable with. Because of this, we're going to ignore the rules for mustering your army and building what's called a list for now. For a starter army, it's hard to go wrong with a squad of basic models from that army and a character that can act as their leader. But honestly, for your first game, choose whatever you like the look of. Aside from the models, there's a couple of other things you'll need to play your first game. You'll need a few six-sided dice, a measuring tape that shows inches, a surface to play on, a dining table is perfect, and some stuff to use as your in-game terrain to give your model some cover, and maybe block line of sight. This can obviously be proper kits you've bought, like this, or stuff you've made yourself, like these. If you want to get started right now though, you can use any old stuff you have lying around. Books, boxes, and bottles make great starter terrain. A bit of imagination can go a long way. Let's take a closer look at the armies we chose for this demo game, shall we? This is my small Chaos Space Marine warband. Leading them is the Master of Possession, a warp-infused, chaotic superhuman encased in ancient power armour and bristling with psychic energy. Under his command are five Chaos Space Marine legionaries, massive, powerful, heavily armoured super soldiers equipped with bolt guns and bolt pistols, brutal anti-infantry weapons that fire explosive rounds. The champion of the squad has a plasma pistol and an accursed weapon. Plasma weapons are much stronger than bolt guns and are perfect for taking on more heavily armoured targets, but they're a little bit more dangerous for the person who fires them too. Also joining the fray is a mob of 10 Chaos Cultists. These are basically just humans, armed with weapons and armour that we'd be familiar with today, so should give you a good idea of how 21st century armies might fare in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium. This gnarly cultist champion has a bolt pistol and a brutal assault weapon. Four have auto pistols and brutal assault weapons, so they're mostly focused on close range fighting. And there's four models with cultist firearms, longer range weapons. And because there's a unit of ten, one is allowed to have a special weapon. And because they'll be facing swarms of horrible little space bugs, I've gone for a flamer. I've also chosen to give all of them the keyword Chaos Undivided, which will make their attacks a bit more potent when I choose to activate their army ability. None of that is going to matter though, because this lot are going to get eaten alive. Say hello to my little Tyranid Swarm. Keeping things simple, I'm going to be using just two types of model. First, the leader, the Tyranid Winged Hive Tyrant. She is one hungry gal, and she's got a taste for Chaos Space Marines. She's incredibly tough, strong, and a fierce combatant. She's carrying a monstrous bone sword and a lash whip to mince things up in melee. 
following her into battle are 20 mindless space bugs called termagants, and they're equipped with horrible little guns called flesh borers. They're not strong, they're not tough, but there are bloody loads of them. So like Guy has chosen, I've chosen a separate keyword and I've got Endless Swarm. What this allows me to do in my command phase is actually to bring back some of those termagants that I've potentially lost throughout the battle. Nice. Now, all these models have statistics that tell you what they're able to do in the game, and they're found in things called data sheets. Yeah, I know, this can look a bit confusing if you're not used to tabletop war games yet, but it's honestly pretty simple. Let's start from the top, comparing the Chaos Cultists, for example, with the Tyranid Winged Hive Tyrant. M stands for movement. This is how far these models can move, measured in inches. The cultists have a movement of 6 inches, which is standard for humans in the game. The tyrant's massive, winged, agile body lets it move 12 inches. T stands for toughness, which is used to determine how easily models get wounded. The cultists, and most humans in the game, have a toughness of 3. The tyrant has a toughness of 9 so is much, much harder to hurt. SV stands for save, the defensive quality of the model's armour. The number shows what you have to roll on a single dice to save any incoming wounds. Now, the cultist's flimsy armour will only save them on rolls of a 6 or higher, but the impenetrable chitin of the tyrant will deflect any wounds on a roll of 2 or higher, so only rolls of a 1 will wound. Speaking of wounds, that's what W stands for how many wounds a model can sustain before it dies. Sustaining just one wound will kill a cultist, but the tyrant has to take 10 wounds before it'll die. LD is for leadership, how brave or disciplined that model is. The lower the number, the better, and we'll see why shortly. Finally, OC stands for objective control. Basically, how good a particular model is at scoring and holding important objectives. The tyrant has the best score here, three, but there's only one of her. Even though the cultists only have a score of one, there are ten models in the squad. So if it was at full strength, that's an objective control value of ten versus the tyrant's three. The cultists have an advantage here, <laughs> first time for everything. Don't worry if that was a lot to take in, we'll learn about how each stat works in the game as we go. The data sheets also contain stats for the weapons your models are equipped with too, as well as some special rules that are specific to those units in particular. Let's take a look at the weapons my nasty little termagants are carrying so you can get your head around the weapon stats. The ranged weapons, the flesh borers here, have a range of 18 inches. Each time they shoot, they make one attack. That's essentially how many dice are rolled per shot. So if 20 termagants shoot, I'll be rolling 20 dice. If it had two attacks, then I'd be rolling 40 dice instead. In Warhammer 40k, BS doesn't mean bullshit, it means ballistic skill. That's the number you need to roll or get higher than to successfully hit your target when shooting. A ballistic skill of 4 plus means each dice roll of a 4, 5 or 6 will hit the target, but 1s, 2s and 3s will miss. S is simply the strength of the weapon, which when compared with the toughness of whatever model you're shooting at, will determine what you need to roll to actually wound them. And Hold that thought, I reckon we should just quickly cover how this works while we're on the topic. When the weapon's strength and the target's toughness are equal, you need to roll fours to wound, so half a chance you'll be successful. When the strength is higher than the toughness, you only need to roll threes, so a bit more likely to happen. When the target's strength is double or more the toughness, like strength eight versus toughness four, you only need to roll twos, so it's really likely to be successful. On the other hand, when strength is lower than the toughness, you're going to need to roll fives, so success is less likely. And you can probably see where this is going. When the strength is half the toughness or less, like strength three against toughness six, for example, you're going to need sixes to be successful. So not impossible, but pretty hard to achieve. Okay, back to the stats. AP stands for armor penetration. Some weapons are designed to penetrate, melt, or otherwise bypass armor, so have negative values which apply to the target's armor save to make it worse for them. So, for example, an AP of minus one, like these weapons, will mean that it makes the save roll more difficult by one point. If your armor save was on a four or more, you'd need to roll fives. 
If it was AP minus three instead, you'd have to make the save three points more difficult, which would make it an impossible roll of seven, which as you know, you can't get on a six sided dice. Finally, the last stat of the weapons is D, which means damage. This is the number of wounds that are inflicted if the opponent fails their armor save. Even a lowly damage of one, as we've learned, is enough to outright kill a cultist, or actually, even one of those termagants too. The keen eye among you might also have noticed that these weapons have types, like assault on the flesh borers, and we'll bring these up as we use them in the game too. All data sheets also include things like units, particular special rules, or abilities which you can use in the game, as well as keywords like infantry, battle line, endless multitude, which will help you know which units you can and can't target with certain abilities. Don't worry about that too much right now though, it will make more sense when you see how it works in the game. Also on the data cards, you can find information on the loadouts for the models, useful to check out when deciding what weapons your armies will have when you're building your models. It also shows how many models should be in the squad, and, if it's a leader, what kind of unit it can attach itself to and lead. While this video will teach you all the core concepts and basics of how to play, there are a few useful free resources that you might want to have handy too. There's the Warhammer 40k Quick Start Guide, which covers the really basic stuff, and then there's also the Core Rules set, which is more comprehensive about how the game actually works. There's an official app too, which also has the Core Rules and an Army Builder. Right now, at the time this video was made, all the rules and data cards are accessible, apart from armies that have had their 10th edition codex released. To access those armies, you need to enter a code found in the book to see the data. If you prefer having a book, the official core rules for the game is filled with loads of backstory, cool art, little stories, and, of course, the full rules, covering everything you need to know for the actual game itself. The rules for all the characters, squads and vehicles are available in the app, to download as PDFs, or buyable printed index cards. Historically, each army has its own rulebook, known as a codex, that has all the statistics for all of the models in that army and the army-wide special rules. But 10th edition saw a total rules reset for all the factions in the game. At the time of recording, only the Tyranids have a 10th edition codex available. I'm sure that soon enough, the codex for your army of choice will get its release, and it will be a great resource, but for now, the free index cards and fresh rules for all factions make it a great time to get into Warhammer 40k. In terms of list building and creating your army, there are some basic steps to follow, but don't be too concerned with that for learning the basics of playing the game. That will come later when you're more comfortable with the rules. One thing we're going to do though is choose what's called a Warlord for each of our armies. As we've only got one character each, it's an obvious choice for the armies we've picked here. My Wing Tyrant and Guy's Master of Possession. That's pretty much everything you need to know before you get moving models and rolling dice. But the very first and most important rule of them all is have fun. Remember that you're playing a game. Games are meant to be fun. It's a pretty complicated game and you'll often find yourself in a sticky point where you're not quite sure how a particular game mechanic works. If you're ever unsure of a rule, just make a note of it so you can figure it out later, come to an agreement with your opponent on how to proceed, and just carry on with your game. Here's our little battlefield setup with some terrain. For this demo, Ant and I are going to play three battle rounds. In each battle round, each player has a turn, so that's three turns each. Regular, larger games of 40k last longer, usually five rounds. Some mission types you'll find in the rulebook and various supplements might feature things called objectives. These are areas of importance on the map, and you'll often want to hold them for certain tactical reasons. They are represented by 40mm markers. Pro beginner tip, if you don't have any markers the right size, you can use Oreos. They're exactly 40mm, just don't eat them before you finish the game. To show you how the objective mechanic works in the game, for this demo we're going to place four objectives on the board. These can be held during the game to score victory points. The winner for this mission will be whoever has the most victory points, or whoever totally destroys their opponent's army. This makes games of 40k a bit more interesting than just shooting and chopping each other into bits. There are lots of other types of missions you can play, with different victory conditions and challenges to try out. Ant and I set up the board together, making it look cool with a mix of terrain bits, stuff that we've either bought or built ourselves, and at this point we don't know who is going to be setting up where, so we try to keep it fair 
cover and line of sight blocking elements quite evenly spaced. Now we're going to mark out what's called deployment zones. We note where the centre of the board is, and leave a 24 inch no man's land in the middle. By marking out a line using dice 12 inches from the centre on each side, just to remind us where the imaginary line is, and once we've deployed our armies we can remove the dice and get them out of the way. 10th edition uses the concept of attackers and defenders. Either follow the mission's map to see which deployment zone is which, or decide for yourself if you're just playing a casual learning game like this. And then, both players roll off. The winner of the dice roll, me in this case, will deploy in the attacker's zone. That's going to be on the left on our map. The loser is the defender, and will be set up in the defender's zone on the right. The attacker starts placing models first, one unit at a time. Just a quick note on terminology for the rules before we begin. So individual fighters within a squad are referred to as models, while the squads are referred to as units. When placing and moving your models, if they're in units like these cultists, legionaries and termagants are, you need to keep the model in what is called unit coherency, which is basically a fancy way of saying that models have to be within 2 inches of each other and within 5 inches vertically if some models are on top of terrain. Also, if you have a unit with 7 or more models in it, you can't string it out like this. Each model has to be in coherency with two other models. So this would be fine. This guy's within 2 inches of 2 models. So is this one, and this one, and so on. Also, in Warhammer 40k, we always measure distances from the edges of the bases, not any weird sticky out bits on the models themselves. While Ant is deploying the Tyrant and his Termagant separately, the data card for my Master of Possession says it can be attached to my squad of Legionaries. So I place them down together. For the rest of the game, they will be treated as one unit of Leader and Bodyguard. This also means that this will afford him a bit of protection during the game as the Bodyguard take damage before the Leader does. And he'll also be buffing the Chaos Space Marines he's leading. Each player's turn in a battle round consists of a few different phases. These are Command, Movement, Shooting, Charge, and Fight. Let's work through them in order, and we'll see who goes first by rolling off one more time. Nice! I scored higher, so I get to go first. The Command phase is where you score victory points, generating command points and where some units will be able to use certain abilities. Both players get one command point here, not just the player whose turn it is. Command points are used to power special abilities called stratagems that we'll demonstrate later in the battle. We don't start scoring objectives until battle round 2, but my cultists do have a special rule I can use here. For the Dark Gods. It makes this objective they're close to stay in my control, until it's held by my opponent. Let's do it. Now we can head into the next phase. In the movement phase, I can move my models, if I want to. Remember, we can find out how far they can move by looking at the datasheet. As we said, M is for movement. The cultists have a movement of 6 inches, and so do the legionaries, but the master of possession has a movement of 8. I'll move the legionaries and their leader up, just a little bit, not their full 6 inch movement, just to make sure their weapons are in range of the enemy. Now that the cultists have used their ability on this objective, I know it's safe and if I leave it, it still counts as mine. So let's start moving them up. Tactically, these guys are pretty cheap and expendable. I want to move them up as far as I can, so I'm going to do a thing called advancing, where they'll be sacrificing shooting or charging to move even further. To determine how many extra inches the unit moves, we roll a dice and add that number to its move characteristic. Only a 2. Not brilliant, but that 2 added to the 6 of their movement means they can move 8 inches, I think I'm going to head for that other objective marker, rather than straight at the enemy. By the way, when moving models, measure from the same point, so say the front of the bases, to where the front of the base will go, like this. Don't give yourself extra movement by having that model totally clear their movement range from the front of the base to the back of the base. All of my models have moved now. You can keep your model still if you want, but once you're happy, it's time to move on to the shooting phase. I can now choose to fire at Ant's Tyranids, from any unit that can see them and that has weapons in range. So now let's take a look at the data sheets for our weapons. We can ignore the cultists for now as we advanced, so we wouldn't be able to shoot any of their weapons unless their guns had the assault keyword, which none of them do. 
So let's look at the Legionaries. They're all now within 24 inches of the Termagants, so we can see that their bolt guns are now in range. The Master of Possession can also perform a ranged psychic attack in the shooting phase, but uh, bah, it only has a range of 18 inches, so won't be able to target anything. Maybe next round. Now, I'll let Ant know my intentions to keep things clear for both players. Ant, I'm going to be firing four bolt guns into your Termagants. Okay, show me what they can do. To find out how many shots we get to make, we look at the weapon's A stat. This means attacks. Bolt guns have two attacks each, and I have four of them, so I'll need eight dice. One for each attack. Now, we need to find out if these shots are going to be accurate and actually hit their target. This is known as rolling to hit. The weapon profile has a stat called BS, which stands for ballistic skill. In other words, how accurate the weapon is. We can see it says 3 plus, meaning that every dice we roll that shows a 3 or above will hit the target. Okay, half of them hit. Now we'll need to see if these hits wound their target. To figure out what we need to roll, we need to compare the strength, S, of the bolt guns against the toughness, T, of the termagants. Bolt guns are pretty powerful and have a strength of 4. Termagants only have a toughness of 3. Because the strength of the attack is greater than the toughness of the target, the shots will wound on a 3+. So now we roll all of the dice that previously hit. Excellent! Only one failed, meaning I've got 3 potential wounds going through. Now, there's a chance that the Termagant's chitinous armour plates will save them from those wounds. For each successful wound I just rolled, the victim of the attacks, Ant, has to roll one dice. Okay, so I've got three wounds I need to save against. Let's just quickly check the Termagant's data sheet to see what its save is. Five plus. Okay, cool. That means that if I roll a five or higher on any of these dice, their natural armour will protect them and they don't lose that wound. Ah... They all failed. That means I have to now allocate three wounds to my Termagants. And as we can see by looking at their profile, each model only has one wound to lose. And the bolt guns have a D, a damage stat, of one. So that means three of them are dead. Good job I've still got another 17 to go. The persons whose unit received the casualties chooses which models to allocate wounds to and then removes them. By the way, the dice I'm using are the Games Workshop Tyranid dice, and they've got a funky little Tyranid symbol where the six would be on ordinary dice. So if you see that symbol, that means it's a six. Normally good news. Now, as I don't have any other units with weapons in range or that are available to shoot, that means it's now the end of the shooting phase. Just a quick extra note here, you'll often find your unit partially in range during the shooting phase. Maybe the front few models have their weapons in range, but the ones at the back don't. In these instances, you don't just say, well, the whole unit is within range, so everyone can shoot. You have to determine on a per model basis which models are in range, and only they can attempt their attacks. Okay, let's get back to the game. And now we move on to the charge phase. For a unit to be able to charge, they need to be a maximum of 12 inches away from the enemy. This is because the charge distance is determined by rolling two dice and combining the results. Every one I have is more than 12 inches away, so I won't even be able to attempt any charges. That means we can skip forward to the fight phase. But yeah, as you probably guessed, no one successfully charged and there are no ongoing fights. So that's essentially my turn over with. Time for Ant's turn in battle round one. Right, Tyranids turn one, and I'm going to start with the command phase. We both get another command point, so now we both have two to play with. One of the Tyranids army rules is called Shadow in the Warp. Now, it can be used in either player's command phase. I could use it now, but I think I might save it until another turn because it can only be used once per game. So now, on to the movement phase. Right, let's see how far those Termagants can actually move. I really want to move them up so they can get a little bit closer on that objective. So I'm going to try and advance them, but they won't be able to shoot after advancing unless their flesh borer weapons have the assault keyword. Let me check. Oh yeah, here it is. They do. Let's roll to see how far they advance. Oh yeah, here we go, lads. Six inch move plus six inch advance roll. That's a massive 12 inches that I can play with. No giggling at the back. Up they go all over that objective. You'll notice some of them cleared some battlefield debris in their movement. If the stuff is under two inches in height, it's ignored for the purposes of movement. 
While we're on the subject of moving over terrain, let me quickly show you all the basics of how that works. As Ant has already said, if stuff is under 2 inches in height, it can be ignored when moving, but if it's over 2 inches, then you use your movement to scale the terrain up, across and down. So let's say these cultists wanted to hop up onto this crate, using their normal 6 inch movement they'd use 3 inches to scale up and then can use the rest of their movement, 3 inches in this case, to move across the crate. Same goes for moving down, you don't just jump down and ignore downward distance, you have to measure the distance and include it in your movement. Back to Ant's movement phase. Now how about my winged hive tyrant? With its 12 inches of movement there's a pretty good chance I can charge those pathetic little cultists over there and just carve them up into little tiny bits. So I'm going to head straight for them. Instead of wasting part of their movement going up and down terrain features like regular infantry, things with the fly keyword like Ant's Flying Hive Tyrant can measure diagonally from point to point, letting them cover ground much faster and scale terrain a bit more easily. Yeah, hello. I don't like the look of that monster flying towards me, so I'm going to use one of my two command points to activate a stratagem called Overwatch. Basically, once per turn, you can choose to have a go at shooting any enemy within 24 inches of that unit that's shooting, so long as it's still visible to them, which that tyrant definitely is now, either at the start or end of a movement in their movement phase or as a charge is declared or completed in the charge phase. Well, she just moved, and now she dies. The best part is that because she's within 12 inches, every single one of my weapons is now in range. The only downside to firing Overwatch is that you don't use the regular ballistic skill of the weapons. Everything only hits on sixes, to represent the frantic firing at the enemy bearing down on them. Let's go one by one. The champion has a bolt pistol, so that has one attack, and is now hitting on a six. Ah, close but no. Four of them have auto pistols, one attack each, so four dice hitting on sixes. Ah, again, nothing. Hmm, not looking good so far. Now, four of them have cultist firearms, which have a new keyword we haven't seen yet. Rapid fire one. This means that if the target is within half the weapon's range, so that would be within 12 inches for a weapon with 24 inch range like this, it gets an extra shot, shown by the number after rapid fire. So each of these guns is now firing two shots instead of just one. Four models, two attacks each, that's eight dice, hitting on sixes. Yeah, two, that's better. Right, let's see if those wound. The firearms have a strength of three, and now we're going to compare that to the toughness of the tyrant. Uh, yeah, Guy, the winged hive tyrant has a toughness of nine, and because that's double the strength of your weapon, three times the strength in fact, yeah, you're going to be wounding on sixes, so um, good luck with that. Uh, no, <laughs> nothing at all. Okay, the last thing I can shoot with is the flamer. This weapon has the torrent keyword, which means that you don't roll to hit. The hits automatically make their mark, which is very useful for situations like Overwatch. I just want to find out how many attacks it makes. D6. That means we roll one dice, a D6, to see how many shots it can make. Nice, a five. So that means five attacks automatically hit, straight on to the wound rolls. So it's strength... Four. Oh no, that's still less than half the target's toughness of nine. This thing is ridiculously tough. Only wounding on sixes again. Ha ha! A six! Against all the odds, I managed to hurt the tyrant. Whoa, 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 whoa there, guy. Actually, you're forgetting about my armor save. She's got an armor save of two plus. So I just roll one dice, and it's only a one that will fail. Well, that's pretty typical. Um, that's just one wound loss though, bringing her down from 10 to 9. When you're losing wounds, you might want to place a couple of dice next to each model so that you know how many wounds they have left. Now after that incredible display of firepower from your cultist guy, are you quite done? Yeah, yeah, that's all I've got for Overwatch. Not a brilliant use of a command point, but at least I tried. After I was rudely interrupted, that's actually my movement phase done. On to my shooting phase. I equip my winged hive tyrant with close combat weapons rather than any ranged weapons, so she hasn't got anything to shoot. But those termagants have 17 left, all with flesh borers. As I already said, they're assault weapons, so I can still shoot them even though I advanced, and they're all targeting the legionaries. One attack each on the profile, so here's 17 dice coming your way, hitting the target on fours and above. 
Ooh, that's a fair few hits. I'm, I'm all right with that. Now, you might just think that because this swarm are cheap, plentiful infantry, their guns might be a bit rubbish, but they're actually strength five, which is more than your legionnaire's toughness, right, guy? Um, yeah, they're only toughness four. That means that, looking at the table, the strength being higher than the toughness in this case, I'll be wounding on threes and above. Here we go. Wow, only one fail and seven wounds. <laughs> okay, uh, time for my armor save. The debris in front of my legionaries will afford me some cover. The benefit of cover means I increase my save by one point. But annoyingly, if you have a save value of 3+, plus or 2+, plus, you don't get the benefit of cover against weapons with an AP of 0, just so you know. So, still looking for 3s or higher. <laughs> oh no, that's five fails. Not what I wanted at all. Now, let's see what we're dealing with here. The Flesh Borers have a D, that's damage, of one. My legionaries are superhuman, tougher than the cultists and the termagants, and have a wound characteristic of two. That means each model can take two wounds before it gets removed. So, it looks like my legionaries are going to have to lose five wounds. Remember that they're being led by the Master of Possession. He has a special rule called Demon Kin, which gives a couple of buffs to that unit he's leading. One of them is called Feel No Pain. Basically, imagine this as a last ditch attempt to ignore any wounds that you've just suffered, taken after any regular saving rolls you'd have. This bonus save is denoted by the number after Feel No Pain, so six plus in this instance. Okay, we've got five wounds to save, let's give it a go. <laughs> nope, no sixes this time. Oh well, at least they're not all gonna die though. Check this out. As much as I'd like to say that five of them take a wound each and can carry on fighting, it does not work like that. You have to allocate wounds to one model until it's dead, and then the next one, and then so on. So five wounds removed from this squad means two are dead and one is down to a single wound. Well, lucky for you guys, that's the end of my shooting phase now. Now it's on to my charge phase. <laughs> You're so dead. Well, at least those termagants won't be able to charge me because they advanced in the movement phase, so sacrifice being able to make a charge this turn. This tyrant though, oh, oh, she looks angry and she's got cultists on her mind. Guy, I'm going to declare a charge on your cultists. So I need to roll to make a move of eight inches so I can make it to what's called engagement range. That's when enemy models are within one inch of each other. To determine the charge distance, you just roll two dice like this. That is not an eight, it's a seven. I need her to make this charge. So I'm gonna use one of my two command points to use a stratagem called Command Reroll. Each stratagem states when and how it can be used and what its effect is, but you have to pick when to use them carefully as you can't use the same stratagem twice in the same phase. Let's try that again, shall we? Ho oh, ho, that's much better, in we go. Sucks to be him right now. You must get into base to base contact if able to, which I was, but I've got the charge movement to be able to whip round this side a little bit so I can be closer to those legionaries after all this is over. Guess where I'm heading next, guy. <laughs> so that's the charge phase over with. Now, let's fight. The start of the fight phase, my tyrant can use one of its psychic abilities called paroxysm. This is where I choose an enemy unit who's close by and hopefully reduce the number of attacks that they can make. I choose the cultists, obviously, and now I need to roll a dice. So if I roll a one, it means I'm gonna take some wounds, but if it's a two or more, that means that those cultists are gonna do even worse at fighting than they can already. Phew, didn't roll a one. Otherwise, I would have been wounded, but now until the end of this phase, the cultists have to reduce their attacks by one for each weapon. Now, you can never reduce a stat like attacks to zero, but that does mean that your pistol wielding close combat cultists guy are only throwing half the attacks they normally would. In the fight phase, the units who successfully charged attack first. The only model to have charged was the Hive Tyrant, so she gets to attack now. Let's take a look at the profile. We can see she has monstrous bone sword and lash whip, as well as tyrant talons. Now you can't use both of these. You have to choose which profile to use unless it has the keyword extra attacks. 
like the monstrous scythe in Talons do, but she doesn't have those. So it looks like the bone sword and whip will be more effective. So let's use them. Let's look at the attacks. Six. Nice. Six dice in hand. What do I need to roll? We find out with the WS. That's weapon skill. These weapons hit on a two plus, so only ones will fail. Okay, that's just a single one. Not bad at all. So if I've hit their target and this weapon's strength is nine, that's huge compared to the cultist toughness of uh, just three. Because the strength is double over the value of the toughness, I only need twos again. Ah, oh, that's more ones than I want to see here. Now, did you notice the weapon profile has the keyword twin linked? This means that I could re-roll the entire wound roll if I wanted to. And with these ones here, pfft, I think I might just do that. Right, there we are. Everything wounds. Okay, my cultists have a save characteristic of six plus. So now I get to try and save those wounds. Whoa, you don't actually, guy. No, no, you definitely don't. The bone sword and whip have an AP value. That's armor penetration and it's minus two. So that would reduce your save by two points. So a six to an eight and you can't roll an eight on a six sided dice. So you can't make the save. Those wounds go straight through and each successful wound does three damage each. Good stuff. <laughs> now, even though those five wounds do three damage each, each wound will still only kill one cultist. They have one wound each, but the damage doesn't spill over from the five wounds. The other cultists don't die in sympathy for five of their friends receiving enough damage to kill them three times over, if you know what I mean. Now, as I can choose my casualties, I'm going to remove the Flamer and the four cultists that have the long range weapons, as they have only basic close combat weapons and they won't be as useful if the fight continues on somehow. Now all the units that made a successful charge have finished fighting, it's time for everyone else to have a go, starting with the player who isn't currently taking their turn, and that's me. First, I make what's called a pile in move up to three inches to get as many models in engagement range as possible. And now I've got five models with brutal assault weapons. Again, unfortunately, only making one attack instead of the two because of the tyrant psychic ability. So five dice in hand, needing fours to hit. <laughs> only two. I can see how this is going to go already. Strength three against toughness nine on the tyrant, needing sixes to wound. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> oh dear. Well, now we're at the end of the fight phase. My cultists almost needed to take what's called a battle shock test, but I only went down to five models, and that's not below half strength, which would be four or less for a squad of ten. So, no battle shock test yet. Chaos Space Marines, turn two. Okay, command phase now, and I generate an additional command point, bringing me to two. And I also score one victory point, thanks to the cultists using their For the Dark Gods ability on the objective in my deployment zone. Hey, Guy, do you remember how you didn't have to take a battle shock test? Uh, where's this going? Well, as it's somebody's command phase, I'm going to choose my once per battle Tyranid army ability called Shadow in the Warp to force not just those cultists, but all of your units to take a battle shock test. Full strength, half strength, everyone. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, OK, well, at least we'll get to show people how that mechanic works. So to perform a battle shock test, we need to roll two dice and to pass, we need to hit or exceed the leadership characteristic on the datasheet. This is why, as I said earlier on, low leadership scores are quite good. The lower the leadership characteristic, the better, because it makes for easier passing of tests. Right, let's start with the cultists first. Ah, a nine is over their leadership, so they failed. Now let's do the legionaries and the master of possession. They have the same leadership characteristic anyway, so we're looking for a six or more. Nice, passed. But what does that mean for the failed cultists? Well, their OC, that subjective control stat, gets reduced to zero and you can't target them with any stratagems until your next command phase. So sucks to be them right now. Great. Well, right then, uh, that's out of the way on to the movement phase. I don't have any options to move the cultists unless I fall back. But because I failed a battle shock test with them, they'd have to do a thing called desperate escape, where they might die if they try to run away. So I think I'm just going to keep them in combat. 
I'm going to edge the legionaries and the master of possession forward very slightly, just to make sure they're within eight inches, and you'll see why in a minute. Not so fast there, my friend. I'm going to use a command point to fire overwatch at those legionaries. I want to take out as many of those guys as possible before they start firing on me. So 17 termagants are left, all making one attack with their flesh borers. But remember, overwatch only hitting on sixes. So that's just one hit. That's the danger of trying to get sixes, I suppose. Strength five for that weapon against that very measly toughness of four of the legionaries. So I just need a three to wound. At least it wounded. Now it's over to Guy to try and save his wound. Needing a three plus. <laughs> oh, come on. Ah, I need that to be a pass. Otherwise I'm gonna lose another legionary. I'm gonna use a command point reroll to try and reroll that into a three plus save. Ah, <sighs> there we go. Now it's time to wreck up some termagants in the shooting phase. So I've lost two legionaries so far, but I think I've still got enough firepower to whittle those termagants down. And I'm targeting your termagants with the legionaries and the master of possession. Before we start, I'm going to use my last command point to use the grenade stratagem. Because the legionaries have the grenades keyword, before they start shooting, I can target an enemy within eight inches of my unit and throw a grenade. To do this, I roll six dice, and for each result of a four plus, it inflicts what's called a mortal wound, which is basically a wound that you can't make an armor save or an invulnerable save against. One, two, three, four, five. Nice. So that means five termagants are dead straight away. Now we can carry on with the shooting as normal. I've got two legionaries with bolt guns left, and the squad also has a champion with the plasma pistol. Now, if we take a look at the unit composition for the legionaries, you'll see that they are armed by default with a bolt gun and a bolt pistol. But for weapons with the pistol keyword, like the bolt pistol, you have to choose on a per model basis whether you want to use the pistol or any other type of ranged weapon. As we can see, the bolt gun will be doing two shots with basically the same stats, so it's much more useful in this scenario. We'll choose to use these and not the bolt pistol. However, the champion has swapped his bolt gun and bolt pistol for a plasma pistol and an accursed weapon, so he'll be using his only ranged option, that's the plasma pistol. Remember, you choose which weapon type to use for each model, not for the whole unit. Two bolt guns, two attacks each, hitting on threes. Yeah, all of them, excellent. Now let's wound. Strength four against toughness three, because the strength is higher, will be wounding on threes. <laughs> All of them again. Four wounds to save there, Ant. So the termagants there are wholly within that crater, so they get the benefit of cover. So it means that they're going to get a plus one to their saving throw. Normally a five, now it's going to be a four. Ooh, only one saved. That's three more dead termagants. Okay, now let's give the champion a turn with his plasma pistol. This gun actually has two profiles, one standard and one supercharged. The supercharged is obviously stronger, it has better armor penetration and does more damage. But uh, look at this, it has the hazardous keyword, which means that after we use the plasma pistol using this profile, we have to take a hazardous test by rolling one dice. If we roll a one, that model would be destroyed. Pretty harsh. Now, a plasma pistol is already overkill for these termagants, so let's just fire the standard profile. Whoa, you chickening out a bit there, guy. Go on, why don't you overcharge it? Uh, no. Standard shot, needing threes to hit. <laughs> no, he missed, after all that. Now, finally for this squad, the master of possession. He's equipped with a bolt pistol and the right of possession psychic power, which also has the pistol keyword, which means that because they both have the same keyword, we don't have to choose which one to fire. We can use both. So let's try the bolt pistol first, hitting on threes. Nice. And now wounding on threes, again because the strength of the bolt pistol is higher than the toughness of the termagants. Nice. That's another wound there, Ant. Another four plus save to make with your benefit of cover. It's not a four, which means another dead term again. And finally for this squad, I'm gonna use the Master of Possession's Right of Possession power. Again, this has two profiles, one of which is hazardous. Now, the difference here is actually worthwhile because the standard profile has a strength of four, so we'll wound the termagants on threes. However, the focused version has a strength of six, 
which is double the target's toughness of three, so we'll wound on twos. So let's give that a go. This has two attacks, hitting on threes. Nice, both hit. And as I said, wounding on twos. Perfect. And this powerful psychic attack has minus three armor penetration, meaning that the termagants can't save against this even with the benefit of cover. They'd need an impossible roll of a seven, so two more termagants die. Before you speeding away, don't forget to take your hazard test too. Haha, <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten about that. Okay, so I roll one dice, needing anything except a one. <laughs> okay, well, I took the chance, and now I have to deal with the consequences. Fortunately, the way the hazardous rule works is slightly different for characters. Instead of just being removed, they suffer three mortal wounds instead, which, as I've said already, are wounds you can't take a save against. He is more hardy than your average Chaos Space Marine and has four wounds on his profile, and that means that he's now down to just one wound, which is a bit scary. Now, you might think that the shooting phase is over now because my cultists are engaged in combat with the Flying Hive Tyrant, but you can actually use pistol keyword weapons when you're engaged. So the remaining four cultists equipped with auto pistols and the champion equipped with the bolt pistol can shoot. Let's do that bolt pistol first. One attack hitting on fours. A miss. Great. Now one attack from each of the four auto pistols hitting on fours. Two hit, strength three against toughness nine, I'm gonna need sixes. Yeah, yeah, that's none. Super. The cultists are so mismatched against the winged hive tyrant. This really shows how terrifying most enemies are for pretty much regular humans like the cultists are in Warhammer 40k. Now I've only got six termagants left in that squad, definitely under half strength, so I'll need to take a battle shock test, but I do that in the next command phase. By the way, sometimes you might find yourself in a position where you'd like one of your units to fire at multiple enemy units. And you absolutely can. This is called split fire. And you just need to decide in advance who is shooting at who. So say, these two models at this unit and the remaining models at this unit. This is often a good way to target heavily armoured units with a powerful special weapon, while your other troops with regular weapons target infantry, for example. Right, back to it. That's my shooting phase over. Now it's time for the charge phase. I really, really want those termagants out of action, and I think the legionaries have got what it takes. And I'm charging. So as much as I'd like to overwatch, I just can't. I've already done it this turn, and you can only use the stratagem once per turn. So come at me, bro. Just under eight inches away, so I'm gonna need a seven inch roll to be within one inch. Oh, <laughs> a nine, that'll do it. I move all my models up to get into base to base contact wherever possible, and now we can move on to the fight phase. Charged units go first. When that unit's selected to fight, you can do what's called a pile-in move, moving each model up to three inches, getting things in base to base contact wherever possible. And now, as I said, I really, really want these termagants gone, because my cultists have no chance against that tyrant, and I need to help them out. I'm going to use the Chaos Space Marine special army ability called Dark Pacts. This means I can choose for that unit's weapons to have either the Lethal Hits keyword or the Sustained Hits 1 keyword. Lethal Hits would mean that, when I roll to hit, any rolls of a 6, known as critical hits, would automatically wound the target. So bypass the wound roll and go straight to the save roll. On the other hand, Sustained Hits 1 means that for any hit rolls of a 6, again, critical hits, they would generate an extra hit, meaning I would get more chances of wounding. There's a lot of these buggers still left, so I kinda like the sound of the extra attacks, so I think I'll choose Sustained Hits 1 to apply to all of my attacks until the end of the phase. My legionaries in the Master of Possession charged. They get to fight first. Let's do the two legionaries who have bolt guns, but just close combat weapons. They still get three attacks each, showing just what impressive superhuman combatants these legionaries are. Two models, three attacks each, so six dice, with a weapon skill of three plus. Oh <laughs> yes! Every single one hit, and that six means I get an extra hit because of dark pacts. Strength four against toughness three, I'm gonna need threes to wound now. That is fantastic. Only one failed, that means six wound. 
Hey everyone, Editing Guy here. When I was putting this video together, I actually noticed I missed a little rule here. My Chaos Legionaries have got an ability called Veterans of the Long War, which lets them reroll wound rolls of one in the fight phase. Rather than fudge it or gloss over it and pretend it didn't happen, I just wanted to be honest and say, whoops, I forgot this rule. When you're playing a game that's this rule dense and granular, you're going to miss lots of little things like this. It's a game after all, it's supposed to be fun, and even some top level tournament players forget stuff like this sometimes. So go easy on yourself. Right, back to it. Now these basic attacks don't have any AP, armor penetration, so Ant, that means you get to take your full 5 plus save. Wow, that's three saves but two fails, that does mean another two dead termagants. Now it's time for these special weapons. First, the Legionary Champion with the Accursed Weapon. Four attacks just from that, hitting on threes. Uh, <laughs> just one, great. Thank goodness for my Chaos Undivided extra rule, huh? Remember, my Dark Pact is still happening. Let's reroll those ones, needing threes. <laughs> Excuse me? This is the most ridiculously unlucky rolling I've ever seen. Still, just one hit. So this single attack is now strength 5 against toughness 3, so higher than, but unfortunately not double the toughness, so just needing 3s. Okay, at least I made that one. Fortunately it also has an AP of minus 2, which will cancel out the save of the termagants, so that's another one dead. Finally, time for the Master of Possession. He's also going to be affected by the Dark Pact rule for them this turn. The Staff of Possession has 4 attacks, hitting on 3s. Now let's just re-roll that one. <laughs> Still a miss. So much for this Chaos Undivided bonus. Okay, so one miss, but one six. And that six means I'll get an extra hit, so that's still four hits. Now this weapon is strength six, double the term against toughness, so I only need twos here. Ah, not a great roll, one failed, but there's only three term against left, so this still might kill them all. These attacks have minus one AP, so Ant's now looking to save on sixes instead of fives. This is not looking good. Come on, sixes. None. Cool. Well, even though each of these unsaved wounds would do D3 damage, they only have one wound each. So they're definitely just all dead in every single way. By the way, just in case you were wondering, when you see something with D3, it means you roll a D6 and essentially half the value rounding up. So a result of one or two would be one, three or four would be two, and a result of five or six would be three, just so you know. Do you remember that Dark Pact rule I used to buff their attacks? Well, it has a downside. I need to take a leadership test now their fight action is over, and if I fail it, I suffer D3 mortal wounds. Needing a six or more, and <laughs> obviously I fail. <sighs> so how many wounds do I take? D3. Let's try. Okay, cool, just one wound, but we do get to try and save that thanks to the Demon Kin Feel No Pain buff from the Master of Possession. Needing a six? And no, cool. It does mean that that one legionary that just has a single wound remaining dies. Now that particular combat has ended, I can make a consolidation move, up to three inches to get into engagement range of another enemy unit. If that's not possible, I can aim towards an objective. And yeah, I'm gonna do that. So now all the units that have charged and got to fight first are done, it's time for the player whose turn it isn't to choose a unit to fight with. In this case, that's me, so big nasty space bug Pikachu, I choose you. You know the score now, same again, using the monstrous bone sword and lash whip. That's six attacks that are going to be hitting on twos. That's every single one of them. These are strength nine against the toughness three. That means I'm wounding on twos. Hey guy, it would fail on a one, but can you see any ones there? My eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. <sighs> no. And with AP minus two, it means you also don't get a save. Safe to say that those cultists are out of here. Now, just like Guy did, I get the chance to consolidate. But even with a three inch move, I wouldn't be able to get an engagement range or hold an objective. So there's nothing I can really do for now. And with the cultists and termagants now dead, there's no one to fight back and there's no one to take a battle shock test. Oh, and hey, would you look at that? It's Tyranid turn two. In my command phase, we both get another command point. I don't score any victory points because my termagants lost that objective, sadly. 
So I know that Guy already has a victory point and will probably score another one with his legionaries stuck on that other objective unless I can kill enough of them to stop him from doing that. Maybe killing him entirely is my only option for victory. Seems a pretty fitting tactic for those all-consuming Tyranids. Okay, movement phase now. 12 inches straight towards those legionaries. Again, thanks to the flying rule, that tyrant can easily close the distance, measuring diagonally up to the edge of the building in the way, moving over it, and then measuring diagonally down to the floor again. My hive tyrant doesn't have any ranged weapons, so I'll skip the shooting phase completely, and we'll go straight into the charge phase. So that hive tyrant only needs a 5 inch charge to get into engagement range and start fighting those legionnaires. Come to mummy, you little chaos face marines. In the fight phase, the units that charge first get to fight first, remember. But before we do that, let's not forget to cast Paroxysm. We roll 1d6, looking for a 2 or more. Now all of the legionaries and the Master of Possession will be making one few attacks with each of their melee weapons. Monstrous Bone Sword and Lash Whip time. Six attacks coming up, hitting on twos. Wow, that's all of them hitting the mark again. Strength 9 of the Hive Tyrant's weapons against Toughness 4 of the Chaos Space Marines. I still only need twos to wound because the strength is double or more of the toughness of the target. Whoa, okay, so it's not every single one. There was one fail and I could re-roll the whole thing because of the twin-linked weapon type. But I think I'll just leave it as it is. This should be enough to give them a good pummeling. Guy, what are you going to do about that? I'm going to make loads of armor saves, that's what I'm going to do. Well, because the AP, the armor penetration on this weapon, is minus two, it means your power armor save of three gets reduced to a five. Okay, well, I'm going to need me some five ups. Yes! Aha! I saved three of them, so only two fail, and they're only one damage each, right, Ant? Oh, um, no. Sorry about that. Each failed save inflicts three damage, and your legionaries only have two wounds each, right? So two wounds going through will outright kill two legionaries straight. I might as well use my single command point to re-roll one of those saves, maybe to keep the champion with his accursed weapon. <laughs> no, one's not going to do it. Now I still get to take my feel no pain of 6+, plus, but I have to roll against all the damage I received, which is 6. Nope. Even with a 6 saving one of those wounds, that still means 5 go through, which is still enough to kill both legionaries who took the wounds. Okay, well that only leaves my Master of Possession behind, and he's got only one wound left. Time for my Master of Possession to fight back. Four attacks. No, 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 no. It's three attacks. Remember I used paroxysm on you. <laughs> three attacks. Hitting on threes. Okay, all three hit. Now, this is strength six, which is pretty high, but still lower than the toughness of the target. So I would be wounding on fives. But did you notice the special keyword the Staff of Possession has? anti psyker two plus. That means that if it targets a unit that has the Psyker keyword, which the Tyrant does, it wounds on a 2+, which I really need right now. Awesome. All three wound. Now the weapon profile has an AP of just minus one though. And remember the Tyrant has an armor save of a ridiculous 2+. So I just need to roll three saves of three or higher. Woo! That's all of them saved. Ah, so annoying. Those three shots had the potential to do D3 damage each, and your Tyrant only has nine wounds left, so it could have totally killed it outright. Yeah, but it didn't, and I saved it. <laughs> yeah, you saved it. Anyway, Chaos Space Marines turn three, right? Command phase. We both generate another command point, but even though I'm on that objective, it's contested because the Hive Tyrant is here too. So in this instance, we look at the OC stat of each model. I have an OC of 1, and the Winged Hive Tyrant has an OC of 3. So the Tyranids have the highest score, so I don't hold the objective and can't score it. That objective in my deployment zone is still technically mine because of the cultist ability I used right at the start. It still carries on even though they're dead now, so at least I get one more victory point. Let me use that single command point right now on the skin shift stratagem, a special one that the Chaos Space Marines have, which lets a unit regain up to three lost wounds. So now he's back up to full strength again on four wounds. Now we're going to bypass the movement phase because I'm locked in combat. I could choose to fall back if I wanted and use my normal movement stat to move out of combat, but I would sacrifice being able to shoot or charge. 
not a great tactical choice here, so I'll stay in the fight. Now into the shooting phase. Let's not forget I can shoot pistol keyword weapons at point blank range, so let's do that. First up, the bolt pistol. One shot, hitting on threes. Strength 4 against toughness 9, so I'm needing 6s to wound. Yeah, fat chance. Ok, let's try the right of possession psychic power, and you know what? Death or glory, let's use the focus version. Two attacks, hitting on threes. Both hit. Now, because of the anti-psyker 2 plus keyword, we're looking to wound on twos and above, because the tyrant is a psyker. Yes, both wound. Now the AP of this attack is minus three, which will reduce the tyrant's armor save by three points, from two plus to just five plus. You're in trouble now, Ant. Yeah, it's not quite as bad as you think though. If we take a look at the Flying Hive Tyrant's profile, you can see here that it has an invulnerable save of 4+, which means that I can use that save if armor penetration reduces or removes my save, as the invulnerable save is never modified by armor penetration. So I still need to make two 4+, saves. Oh no! Guy, how much damage is this going to do? Well, because I use the focused version, it's three damage each. Whew, ok, well that's two fails there, which means the Hive Tyrant is now down to just three wounds. But Guy, don't you have to take a hazardous test now? I sure do. Uh, no ones, please. <laughs> Twice in a row! Man, this guy can't catch a break. Now, even though the Master of Possession just lost a few more wounds, you'd think I would be able to use that feel no pain rule he has. But if we take a look at the wording of the rule again, right at the start it states, while this model is leading a unit. This kind of wording is open to interpretation, but as far as I understand it, he isn't leading a unit anymore. All the legionaries are dead, so that bonus is removed. No more feel no pain saves for you, pal. Another three wounds taken, down to just one. Ok, well, time to move on to the fight phase, and hopefully time for Lady Luck to smile on me for once. Because it's my turn and no one charged this turn, no one has the fight first keyword, so it means that the player whose turn it isn't gets to choose who to fight with first. Oh yeah baby, it's flying hive tyrant time. So as before, six attacks, hitting on twos. So just missed one there. Strength 9, toughness 4, so needing 2s to wound again. So there's 2 fails there. Weapons have got the twin linked keyword. I'm going to roll that whole thing again. We've converted from 2 fails to 1 fail. I'm happy with that. Guy, these have minus 2 AP. It takes your save from a 3 plus to a 5 plus. So close, but no cigar. 2 wounds at 3 damage each, that's 6 damage to allocate. My Master of Possession has 1 wound. And I don't have any special rules or anything to negate the wounds, and don't have any command points to try to re-roll one of those saves. So yeah, he's just dead. Ooh, the sweet smell of victory. So even though Guy was ahead on victory points, I completely destroyed his army. So I win this game. You'll find totally destroying your opponent's force much easier to do in smaller games, but much more difficult in larger games. So always try to keep on top of victory points and play strategically. Well, that's about it for this little demo game and the video. We hope you found this video useful and it's helped you form a rough outline of the basic mechanics of Warhammer 40,000 10th edition. This is obviously no replacement for getting hold of the rulebook, but it should give you a good foundation to start to play games. There's lots of other elements to explore, like moving over terrain, getting in and out of vehicles, flyers, and how big, monstrous models interact with cover, that sort of stuff. But as you play more games, read more rules, and watch more battle reports, you'll pick up on how these things work in no time. Remember that Warhammer 40,000 is almost constantly evolving, with regular FAQs, minor rule changes, but it's all still based on the core concepts we've shown you in this video. So good luck getting started! If you're looking for easy to follow painting advice and fast, fun battle reports, subscribe to this channel. If this video has helped you out and you're feeling super generous, please consider buying us a coffee using our PayPal tip jar linked in the description. No exaggeration here, Midwinter Minis exists entirely due to the generosity and support of our amazing fans on Patreon. So if you want to join the club and help us make videos like this, you can join from just $2 a month. Thank you so much for watching, please share this video with any newcomers to the game if you think they'd find it useful, and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now! Bye everyone!